I never knew what hate was until now. Hey everybody, welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host, and today we're going to talk about the case of Stacy Ruth Daniels. She was born on July 24th, 1967, and living in Weedsport, New York. In 1985, when she was only 17, she met Michael Wallace. It was an instant bond. The couple ended up getting married, and they had their first daughter, Ashley, in 1988. They had a second daughter named Bree in 1991. Stacy worked as a 911 dispatcher, and Michael worked nights as a mechanic. They were both hard workers, but money was still tight. Just like most relationships, anytime that there's financial hardship, couples grow apart. And that's what happened here, too. It was also rumored that they were both having affairs. Everything that you'll hear on this episode tonight was from ABC News, The Daily Mail, Wikipedia, Oprah Daily, and I've watched some of the crime shows that um, these are on, like Forensic Files and stuff, but I didn't, I didn't take any notes on that. So. In late 1999, Michael came down with a strange illness. His symptoms didn't really all go together. He was coughing, that's normal, but he also became swollen. At least he appeared swollen, and it affected the way that he walked. It made it so he wasn't very good on his feet. His family was really urging him to go and see somebody because none of this was normal. But, I mean, typical man. He did not, and unfortunately, in early 2000... He was found dead at home on the couch. The only person that was home was 12-year-old Ashley. She blamed herself for this because she didn't think he looked very good that day. But she didn't really do anything about it either. She was just a child. How was she supposed to know? They ruled his death as a heart attack. Although Michael's sister wasn't really sure if she believed this. She wanted an autopsy. But Stacy refused. She said that she sided with the doctors. There was no need for an autopsy. It's a heart attack. In 2003, when Stacy was 41, she met David Castor. They too would get married. He was the owner of an air conditioning installation and repair company called Liverpool Heating and Air Conditioning. She worked there as the office manager. She thought she found her prince charming. He was tall. He was good looking. He owned his own business. He was outdoorsy. He was good to her kids. He was able to give her things that she wasn't really able to have before. Two years into the marriage, that August of 2005, about two o'clock in the afternoon, 911 gets a call and it's from Stacy. She's telling them that she's not able to get a hold of her husband and that they had been fighting. So she was a little concerned about him and she wanted to know if somebody could help her get in the room. The door's locked. He's not answering. They work together and he never showed up at work. Sergeant Robert Willoughby from the county sheriff's department, he had to kick in the door. He could hear a TV going on, but David wasn't responding. When he kicked open the door, he found 38-year-old David lying naked in their bed. It didn't appear to be a suicide because there was no gun. There was no gun wound. They weren't really sure what they were looking at. But near his body was a bottle of antifreeze. And on his nightstand, there was a glass, and this glass had bright green liquid in it. When they told Stacy that they believe that her husband is dead, she was just inconsolable. While they search the house, they do find some very odd objects. In the kitchen, they found a turkey baster. 
And it looked like that same green liquid was in it. They really didn't know what to make of this situation. They bring Stacy down for questioning and she tells them that you know, the marriage was kind of on the rocks and that he had been depressed. They were fighting and he told her to take the kids and get out. But she never thought that he would do something like this. The coroner reported that David had committed suicide by drinking the antifreeze. Let me just tell you something. Nobody would ever commit suicide that way. That is a horrible death. It's a slow, painful death. With everything that they're finding, they're starting to kind of side-eye Stacy. Could she have done this to him? They send the glass, the turkey baster, all that out to a lab. Get fingerprints. Whose fingerprints are on these items? Is it David's? Is it Stacy's? Or is there another person it could be? Police also wiretap her house. They listen on her phone calls. They set up cameras overlooking her house. And the grave sites of her husband. Let me tell you, she put them right next to each other. She was starting to line them up. The reason why they put it at the grave sites is because was she a loyal wife? Did she actually care? Did she ever go and visit them? They wanted to watch her actions. They wanted to see her behavior. Stacy never went to those grave sites. She didn't care. Investigators think, all right, if we're really going to prove that she killed him by poisoning him, maybe we need to exhume Michael. What if he also died from antifreeze? And that's exactly what they did. They exhumed him so they could do a toxicology, see what that was going to come back as. When the results came back, they were mind blown. He also died from antifreeze poisoning. So what do they do? They take this to Ashley on her first day of college. Oh my God. Probably not the best time to find out that your father was actually poisoned. Of course, now Ashley is a mess. So she calls her mom. Mom, what the hell's going on? They exhumed dad and he died from antifreeze. Her mom said, come home. Come home to Liverpool. We'll have some drinks. She told her that they have been through enough emotional stress and they just need to relax. So come home. Come spend time with mama. Ashley agreed. You know, her mom wasn't just her mom. She was also her best friend. And she's going through the same thing, so why not? They decided that they were going to get together the next day as well. Ashley remembers that her mom gave her a drink, but it didn't taste very good. At first, she refused it, but eventually she just drank it because she trusted her mom. She wanted to trust her mom. But 17 hours later, Ashley was found unresponsive on her bed by her younger sister, Bree. Stacy didn't want to call 911, but Bree demanded that she call 911 to get her help. When Bree came back into the room, she noticed that there was a suicide letter laying next to her sister. And this wasn't just any note. This note would blow the whole case open because Ashley confessed to not only killing her father, but also killing David. When Bree found that note and read it, her mother took it so she could give it to paramedics. When she was at the hospital and they ran tests, they found that she had enough painkillers found in her system that She could have died, and actually she would have died if they would have waited just a few minutes later. 
Bree saved her sister's life. When Ashley regains consciousness, the police are there. They want answers. They have this note, and they're not really sure what to make of it. She tells them the last thing that she remembered was her mom making her an alcoholic drink. She does not know anything about a note, and she's confused. Like, what are you talking about? What note? I did what? For two years, investigators were collecting evidence against Stacy. And in 2007, she was arrested for second-degree murder in David's death and attempting to murder her daughter, Ashley, and to frame her for both murders of David and Michael. At trial, a whole bunch of stuff came out. They found that there were many versions of the suicide letter. It wasn't written once. It wasn't written twice. It was written a few times. Ashley was only 12 at the time of her father's death. Ashley took the stand and she testified that she did not murder her dad, her stepdad. She never wrote the note. District Attorney William Fitzpatrick and Chief Assistant District Attorney Christine Garvey said that the suicide never made sense from the beginning. Especially because it was her fingerprints on the glass and on the turkey baster. They found his DNA, but they found her fingerprints. They believe that he was force-fed the antifreeze. They think that she was doing this to him up to four days before he died, trying to make this look like a suicide. She tried saying that he got this great idea because they watched a news report about Lynn Turner, who ended up murdering two of her past lovers by using antifreeze. So the movie made him want to do it. The prosecutors showed the evidence that they found the growth of calcium oxalate crystals in his kidneys. That's what you see when you've been poisoned. When they looked at her phone records on the day of the murder, they saw that Stacy only called him once. So she lied to 911 saying that she kept calling him and he wasn't picking up. They called her a black widow. They said that she's doing this for money. They both had life insurance policies and they both had estates that could benefit her. She even changed David's will to exclude his son from a previous marriage. How heartless is that? You know, that is one thing I cannot stand when a woman has everything just handed to her and then you kill them just because you don't want to deal with it anymore, but you don't want to give up the lifestyle. And then you have the damn balls to cut out their kids. Mm -mm. So Stacy's defense team, Charles Keller and Todd Smith. So their job is to create reasonable doubt. They tried to poke holes in Ashley's version of what happened. They wanted to prove that she could be a cold-blooded murderer at the age of 12. They tried to say that Ashley was jealous of Bree. She was jealous of the attention that she was getting from her father. And she killed her stepfather because they couldn't get along. Ashley's own grandmother, Stacy's mother, believed that her granddaughter did this. Talk about being in denial. Stacy took the stand in her own defense. She wanted to say, I did not do any of this. She maintained that Ashley is the one who murdered both men. She said that 
she can't speculate about what motives that there were, but she thought maybe she's sick. Maybe she's mentally ill. Maybe she should go to a mental hospital. They asked her, you used to work for a paramedic company, dispatch. Why did you not call somebody for David? Or Ashley. Ashley was like that for 17 hours before they called 911. I mean, David couldn't even stand and he was vomiting. But she said, yeah, but I mean, he looked okay. They pointed out, okay, say both men died. You get your daughter who's sick. Why would you not try to get her help? After losing two husbands. Prosecutors brought up another piece of damaging evidence against Mommy Dearest. They had typing sounds in the background from when they did the wiretaps. She was talking to her friends, just typing away. Stacy told them that she does not remember being on the computer that day. That she doesn't think they are correct. When these notes were typed up, Ashley was in school. There was nobody else home but her. You hear the typing on the the wiretap. Even on the note that was left by Ashley had Stacy's fingerprints on it, not Ashley's. She was trying to frame her daughter so she could get away with murder. Times two. Something else they pointed out to her is the word is antifreeze. But for some reason, it was being called antifree. They saw that in four places within that note. And when Stacy did a interview, she used that exact terminology, Anna Free. She responded saying that she had cut herself off in the middle of saying Anna Freeze because she really wanted to talk about something else. So that's why she stopped. David's first wife, Janice, took the stand and said, this man would never have committed suicide. He loved his life. He loved life in general. He wouldn't have done this. The crazy thing is that, say David would have been cremated, or even if David was never killed. Michael's case never would have been known that it was a homicide. Professor Francis Gengo testified that after analyzing her blood, Ashley's blood at the hospital, that she would have had to ingest alcohol, Ritalin, and several other drugs just several hours before she was hospitalized. On February 5th, 2009, in front of a jam-packed courtroom, Stacy was found guilty of second-degree murder for the poisoning of David and attempted second-degree murder for overdosing her daughter with drugs and vodka. On March 5, 2009, it was sentencing. Chief Assistant District Attorney Christine Garvey asked them to give her the maximum sentence, consecutive sentences, because of the brutality of all of this. She reminded them that Stacy had a party in the backyard with her friends as if nothing happened. And like nothing was happening on the night, Ashley was there comatose in a room. You know, for Stacy, human beings were disposable. Even David's son asked the judge to give her the death penalty. Judge Fahey told Stacy that he had never seen a parent attempt to murder their child in order to set them up for a crime that they themselves committed and declared Stacy that she was in a class all by herself. He sentenced her to the maximum of 25 years to life for the murder of David and another 25 years for the attempted murder on Ashley. She also got an additional one and a third to four years for forging David's will. That trial lasted four weeks. 
that was a lot for everyone to go through. So at the end, Ashley told the judge she hated her mother for ruining so many lives, but she still loved her for the bond she originally had with her. She said, I never knew what hate was until now. Even though I do hate her, I still love her at the same time. That bothers me. It's so confusing. How can you hate somebody and love them at the same time? I just wish that she would say sorry for everything she did, including all the lies. As horrible as it makes me feel, this is goodbye, Mom. As hard as you tried, I survived. And I will survive because I'm surrounded by people that love me. I'm going to do good things in this world despite making me in every sense of the word an orphan. Her earliest possible release date was June 15th of 2055. She was like a month shy of her 88th birthday. But Stacy was found dead in her cell on the morning of June 11th, 2016. They determined that Stacy died of a heart attack. There was no evidence of a suicide or foul play. This mother had to be the cruelest mother ever. Mommy dearest on steroids. Stacy aired a two-hour special on 2020. Stacy told them that Ashley had brought this on and insists that she and Ashley know it really happened. She did express sympathy for her daughter, Bree, who she said was an innocent victim. She lost along with her freedom and her other husband's. She told them that her mother, stepfather, and some of her other relatives, they still support her. That is fucking sickening. I'm sorry. Both Ashley and Bree have never spoken to their mother again. They cut off all ties. When ABC interviewed forensic psychiatrist Dr. James Knoll for a psychological perspective of this letter, he said that usually a suicide note kind of like focuses on themes of remorse and the person not being able to go on with their life. The note was completely different because it was like Ashley was focused on taking the blame for something. This theme was repeated 14 times within the note. He also said with her narcissistic behavior, well, he didn't call her a narcissist, but I'm going to. She's never going to admit for these murders. She'll never do it. And she hasn't done it. Although Stacy wasn't really officially called a serial killer, they do believe that she would have killed again. Killers have many different motives. That's where the Black Widow came from, because that's a woman who kills husbands or lovers for material gain. Psychopathic traits and histories of childhood abuse have been consistently reported in women with these same issues. Forensic Files had an episode titled Freeze Framed, and the DA pointed out that they think Stacy might have even murdered her own father, Jerry Daniels. He died February 22nd of 2002, right after Stacy went and visited him at the hospital. He was in there for some kind of lung issue. But they believe that Stacy had brought him soda, and in that soda was poison. They believe she did that because she was the executor of his estate. Cold-hearted woman, all she cared about was money. Money and Brie. That's it. I don't even know how somebody comes up with a plan like that. You have to be the biggest narcissist to think that you're actually going to get away with this. And how can you frame your 21-year-old daughter? You're going to take away her whole life because you wanted money? Thank God Ashley survived. Thank God Brie was there to freaking help her. You know, her mom was sitting there just watching the clock. Shouldn't be long now. This story, it just, it makes me sick for so many different reasons. 
two people shouldn't have died. Ashley will probably never be the same again. I mean, you're going to have serious trust issues and abandonment issues and, oh. Let me know what you think about this episode. I think she should have gotten the death penalty, but, I mean, she died anyways in her cell, so pretty much she still died in prison. I just wanted to take a minute and apologize for not having an episode last week. I unfortunately gained another angel, and uh, my mind wasn't really in it, so I don't want to give you guys a half ass show, so I just needed a little time to get out of my little funk. But I'm back. Make sure you head over to CrimeOverCocktails.com. That's where you can listen to episodes. If you want to check out the merch, if you need phone numbers, if you know somebody who's suicidal, somebody who's being abused, there is a whole page there dedicated to getting you the help that you need. Are you on Instagram? Come find me, CrimeOverCocktails.com. I also have a Facebook, but let's be honest, nobody cares about that anymore. Make sure to leave a five-star review if you listen on Apple or Spotify. Like, follow, and subscribe. That way you'll know when new episodes are coming out. All right, you guys. We'll talk crime another time. Bye. Bye.